Welcome to the RPTM Podcast, the show that breaks down the myths of monolithic history and tells our story through multiple lenses. I'm your host, Professor Ryan Lancaster. Today's episode is partially underwritten by you, the listener. Find out ways to support the podcast on the website, ryanglancaster.com. Episode 29, Andrew Jackson was a jerk. Pseudo-history is unchanging. It doesn't self-correct or progress. If we don't ever reevaluate, the dinosaurs would still drag their tails, or the Japanese internment camps in the 1940s would still be measured as a success. Unfortunately, many people believe the discipline of history is little more than boring names, dates, and places. See, there is a prevailing misconception that the field involves memorizing facts and little else. Nothing could be farther from the truth. As one of the social sciences, we must understand, historians must approach that history scientifically. History involves cause and effect. Accounts require critical thinking. History consists of testing hypotheses. Historians must construct a narrative. Historians are actually scientists of the past. They formulate interpretations of the past based on the evidence they find. They figure out how and why one thing led to another. Historical change is one of the central components of the discipline. History, much like the phoenix, must die every generation to be born from the ashes of historical thought. Jackson's Inaugural Party The election of Andrew Jackson is no less bitter than the previous one, and Jackson's inaugural party nearly wrecks the White House. President John Quincy Adams boycotted his successor's 1829 inauguration, which was as much a brawl as the previous year's election, which Adams lost to Andrew Jackson. Four years earlier, in 1824, Jackson had lost to Adams. Jackson had received more votes but not a majority in the Electoral College, sending the election to the House of Representatives. A third candidate gave his support to Adams, making him president and leaving Jackson looking for revenge. Both elections were marked by wholesale mud throwing. Adams' partisans called Jackson's wife, Rachel, Jezebel. Previously married, she wed Jackson before her divorce was final. The Adams supporters claimed that Jackson's father was biracial and his mother was a prostitute for good measure. Jackson's supporters fired back with an allegation that, As ambassador to Russia, Adams had doubled as a pimp. They claimed he had American girls render sexual services to the Tsar. Aside from hating each other, Jackson and Adams represented different readings of an American president's specifications. Adams was a Harvard man, and his father had been president. Jackson was an outsider, a precursor of presidents such as Donald Trump and Bill Clinton who seemed to come out of political nowhere. When they squared off, Adams was favored by the East Coast elite. Jackson's supporters were from the West and more rural areas. Their dress and Nina were noted by James Nimrol, a Pennsylvania man who in 1897 recalled to a Tribune reporter what he had seen at Jackson's inauguration, 68 years earlier. It seemed as though every uncouth blackwoodsman and rough in country had made a descent upon the capital. Fully half the crowd wore pistols and had their trousers tucked into their boots, Nimrol said. The joy of the Jackson men knew no bounds, and they were determined to give him such an inauguration as had never been seen before. Jackson's nickname was Old Hickory, earned when he was a general during the War of 1812 and stood ramrod fast alongside his men when the going was tough. Every man carried a hickory stick. Horses were decorated in hickory bark. Women wore necklaces of hickory nuts. Many of his supporters were frontiersmen and first-time voters. In the US, voting initially had been limited to property owners. But that requirement was being dropped in states such as New York, doubling the number of voters in the years between the two Adams vs. Jackson contests. That shift in the weight of the electorate was represented by the log, 
cabin that Jackson's supporters brought to his inaugural procession. He had been born in just such a simple dwelling, which became a symbol of America as a country where a poor boy could grow up to become president. Members of Washington's high society shuddered at that thought, even as they peeked at the parade from their second-story windows. If they held the curtains open long enough, they would have seen something else remarkable, Jackson's inauguration parade lacked that customary military detachment. Adams, who left Washington a few days earlier, had refused to allow soldiers to participate. So Jackson's supporters improvised a militia. However, a number of the old revolutionary soldiers volunteered to act as Jackson's escort, and they surrounded his carriage as he rode to the Capitol, constantly bowing to the right and left to such complimentary shouts as go in Andy, we put you there. Bully for you, old hickory. Give fits, Andy. Jackson himself was in a somber mood. Soon to be Secretary of State, Martin Van Buren saw Jackson in the White House late in the day. I found no one with him except his intimate friend, Major William Berkeley Lewis, Van Buren noted. His health was poor, and his spirits depressed as well by his recent bereavement of his wife, as well as the trials of personal and political friendship which he had been obliged to encounter in the organization of his cabinet. Jackson attributed his wife's death to the abuse she suffered at the hands of his political enemies. He intended to skip the evening's inaugural balls and keep the other ceremonies to a minimum. He delivered a crisp speech at the Capitol, and was sworn in by Chief Justice John Marshall. Then things began to get out of hand. Thousands and thousands of people, without distinction of rank, collected in an immense mass around the Capitol, Margaret Bayard Smith, a Washington socialite, wrote to a friend. Many were determined to follow Jackson to the White House along then unpaved Pennsylvania Avenue. Job seekers wanted to buttonhole him. Others wanted to join in an open house that was to be held there. Countrymen, farmers, gentlemen, mounted and dismounted, boys, women and children, black and white, carriages, wagons all pursuing him to the president's house. Unable to move through that crowd, Smith and her party went to her house nearby. Three hours later, they resumed their journey to the White House. Jackson was already gone. He had been pushed up against a wall by an ever-growing crowd of well-wishers. Fearing he'd be crushed, friends had spirited him out a window and taken him to a hotel, where he remained until the party ended. It was some party, noted Smith. But what a scene did we witness. She wrote. The majesty of the people had disappeared, and a rabble, a mob of boys, negroes, children, scrambling fighting, romping. What a pity, what a pity. No arrangement had been made, no police officers placed on duty, and the rabble mob had inundated the whole house. We came too late. Order was restored only by the quick-thinking White House staff. They pushed the alcoholic beverages being served out a window, and the snickered guests followed. Contemporary accounts of the damage done to the White House ranged from a few broken glasses to oriental rugs ruined by guests who didn't know, or didn't care, to remove their muddy boots. Jackson's opponents, and their present-day counterparts, say the moral of the story is we need to be vigilant against the possibility of mob rule. Jackson's supporters, and their peers, say democracy's enemies exaggerated the episode. Liberia the first group of freed American slaves settles a black colony known as the Republic of Liberia when they arrived on African soil at Providence Island on January 7, 1822. The capital, Monrovia, is named after President James Monroe. The biggest question facing the United States leaders in the early 19th century was what to do about slavery. Should it continue, or should the U.S. abolish it? Could the country be home to free black people and enslaved black people at the same time? 
and if the U.S. ended slavery, would freedmen and women remain in the country or go somewhere else? Many white people at this time thought the answer to that last question was to send free black Americans to Africa through colonization. Starting in 1816, the American Colonization Society, which counted future presidents James Monroe and Andrew Jackson among its members, sought to create a colony in Africa for this purpose. This was 50 years before the U.S. would abolish slavery. Over the next three decades, the society secured land in West Africa and shipped people to the colony, which became the nation of Liberia in 1847. The society spent its first few years trying to secure land in West Africa. In 1821, it dealt with local West African leaders to establish a colony at Cape Mezzardo. The strip of land was only 36 miles long and 3 miles wide. The following year, the society began sending free people, often groups of families, to the colony. Over the next 40 years, upwards of 12,000 freeborn and formerly enslaved black Americans immigrated to Liberia. The American Colonization Society was distinct from black-led back-to-Africa movements that argued black Americans could only escape slavery and discrimination by establishing their homeland. Though some free black Americans may have supported the society's mission, there were also plenty who criticized it. They argue that their sweat and blood, their once enslaved family, built this country, so, therefore, they had just as much right to be here and be a citizen. This is a slaveholder scheme to rid the nation of free blacks to make slavery more secure. In the beginning, the American Colonization Society didn't uniformly believe that slavery should end. The society was made up of white men from the North and South, including slave owners who felt that free black people undermined the institution of slavery and should be sent away. Others felt that slavery should be gradually dismantled but that black people could never live freely with white people. As the abolitionist movement grew in the early 1830s, abolitionists' criticism of society began to erode its support. Unlike the white people in the American colonization society, who believed that slavery should gradually end, abolitionists called for an immediate end to slavery. In addition, many abolitionists considered it cruel to deport black Americans to Liberia, where they struggled to survive in a new environment with new diseases. In 1854, future President Abraham Lincoln agreed with this sentiment when he gave a speech that mentioned colonization as an appealing solution to the moral evils of slavery, but noted its logistical and ethical challenges. If all earthly power were given me, I should not know what to do as to the existing institution. My first impulse would be to free all the slaves, send them to Liberia, to their own native land. But a moment's reflection would convince me that whatever of high hope, as I think there is, there may be in this, its sudden execution is impossible in the long run. If they were all landed there in a day, they would all perish in the next ten days, and there are not surplus shipping and surplus money enough in the world to carry them there in many times ten days. Among people who already believed slavery should end at some point, abolitionists convince most people, particularly in the Northeast, that the colonization movement is anti-black. In particular, the black abolitionist Nathaniel Paul and the white abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison helped discredit colonization by debating its proponents in public. In the early 1830s, Garrison published a book called Thoughts on Colonization containing big passages of black Americans saying why it's bad. The American Colonization Society evolved throughout the 1830s. By the end of the decade, it began to support immediate abolition while still promoting its colony in Africa as a place for free black Americans to relocate. This caused the society to lose support among southern slave owners who were committed to preserving slavery. Joseph Jenkins Roberts, born free in Virginia, became the colony's first black governor in 1841 and declared Liberia's independence in 1847, it became the first African colony to gain independence. By then, the American Colonization Society had lost a lot of money and was falling apart. In its Declaration of Independence, Liberia accused the U.S. of injustices that made separation necessary and urged other countries to recognize its statehood. Still, the United States did not recognize Liberia as an independent nation until 1862, during the American Civil War. That year, enslaved people in Washington, D.C., won their freedom, and Congress approved funds to relocate those who wanted to move to Liberia or Central America. President Abraham Lincoln still believed at this late date that voluntary colonization should go hand in hand with emancipation because he thought black and white people couldn't live equally in the same country. Later in the war, however, 
Lincoln abandoned colonization and publicly supported black men gaining the right to vote. The Petticoat Affair The Petticoat Affair was a U.S. scandal involving members of President Andrew Jackson's cabinet and their wives. Led by Florid Calhoun, wife of Vice President John C. Calhoun, these women, the Petticoats, socially ostracized John Eaton, the Secretary of War, and his wife Peggy Eaton over disapproval of the circumstances surrounding their marriage and what they considered her failure to meet the moral standards of a cabinet wife. The affair shook up the Jackson administration and led to the resignation of all but one cabinet member. It facilitated Martin Van Buren's rise to the presidency. It was, in part, responsible for Calhoun's transformation from a national political figure with presidential aspirations into a sectional leader of the southern states. Peggy Eaton was the daughter of William O'Neill, owner of the Franklin House, a boarding house and bar in Washington, D.C., which was only a short distance from the presidential mansion, making it a popular social center for politicians and military officials. Peggy was well-educated, she studied French and was known for her ability to play the piano. William T. Barry, who later served as Postmaster General, wrote, of a charming little girl, who frequently plays the piano, and entertains us with agreeable songs. Her reputation was already under scrutiny as a young girl because she worked in a bar frequented by men and casually bantered with the boarding house clientele. An elderly Peggy reminisced that, while I was still in pantalettes and rolling hoops with other girls, I had the attention of men, young and old, enough to turn a girl's head. After her father intervened to prevent her elopement with an army officer, in 1816, the 17-year-old Peggy married John B. Timberlake, a purser in the United States Navy. Timberlake, then 39, had a reputation as a drunkard and was heavily in debt at the time of the marriage. The Timberlakes became friendly with John Eaton in 1818. Eaton was a wealthy 28-year-old widower, newly elected U.S. Senator from Tennessee, despite not yet having reached the constitutionally mandated minimum, age of 30, and longtime friend of future President Andrew Jackson. After Timberlake told Eaton about his financial problems, Eaton unsuccessfully attempted to get the Senate to pass legislation authorizing payment of debts Timberlake accrued while in the Navy. Eventually, Eaton paid Timberlake's debts and procured him a lucrative posting to the U.S. Navy's Mediterranean Squadron. Rumelungas said Eaton aided Timberlake to remove him from Washington so that Eaton could socialize with Peggy. While with the Mediterranean Squadron, Timberlake died in 1828, Rumors in Washington suggested he killed himself due to Eaton's supposed affair with Peggy. Medical examiners concluded that Timberlake died of pneumonia brought on by the pulmonary disease. With the encouragement of President Jackson, who liked them both, Peggy and Eaton married on January 1, 1829, shortly after her husband's death. However, according to custom, it would have been proper for them to wait until the end of a longer mourning period. Florid Calhoun, the wife of Vice President John C. Calhoun and therefore Second Lady of the United States, led the wives of other Washington political figures, most notably Jackson's cabinet members, in an anti-Peggy coalition which shunned the Eatons in public, refused to pay courtesy calls on the Eatons at their home or receive them as visitors, and denied them invitations to parties and other social events. Emily Donaldson, the niece of Andrew Jackson's late wife, Rachel Donaldson Robards, and Jackson's confidant Andrew Jackson Donaldson served as Jackson's surrogate first lady. Emily Donaldson sided with the Calhoun faction, which led Jackson to replace her with his daughter-in-law Sarah York Jackson as his official hostess. Martin Van Buren, the Secretary of State, was a widower and the only unmarried member of the cabinet, he raised himself in Jackson's esteem by allying with the Eatons. In part, Jackson was sympathetic to the Eatons because his late wife Rachel had been the subject of innuendo when questions arose during Jackson's campaign for president as to whether Rachel had legally ended her first marriage before she married Jackson. Jackson believed these attacks were the cause of Rachel's death on December 22, 1828, several weeks after his presidency. Jackson appointed Eaton as his Secretary of War, and Eaton's entry into a high-profile cabinet post helped intensify the opposition of Mrs. Calhoun's group. In addition, Calhoun was becoming the focal point of opposition to Jackson, Calhoun's supporters opposed a second term for Jackson because they wanted to see Calhoun elected president.
In addition, Jackson favored, and Calhoun opposed, the protective tariff that came to be known as the Tariff of Abominations. U.S. tariffs on imported goods generally favored northern industries by limiting competition. Still, southerners opposed them because the tariffs raised the price of finished goods, but not the raw materials produced in the south. The dispute over the tariff led to the nullification crisis of 1832, with southerners including Calhoun, arguing that states could refuse to obey federal laws to which they objected, even to the point of secession from the Union, while Jackson vowed to prevent secession and preserve the Union at any cost. Because Calhoun was the most visible opponent of the Jackson administration, Jackson felt that Calhoun and other anti-Jackson officials were fanning the flames of the Peggy Eaton controversy to gain political leverage. Duff Green, a Calhoun protégé and editor of the United States Telegraph accused Eaton of secretly working to have pro-Calhoun cabinet members Samuel D. Ingham and John Branch removed from their positions. Eaton took his revenge on Calhoun. In 1830, reports had emerged accurately stating that Calhoun, while Secretary of War, had favored censuring Jackson for his 1818 invasion of Florida. These infuriated Jackson. For reasons unclear, Calhoun asked Eaton to approach Jackson about the possibility of Calhoun publishing his correspondence with Jackson at the Seminole War. Eaton did nothing. This caused Calhoun to believe that Jackson had approved the publication of the letters. Calhoun published them in the Telegraph. This gave the appearance of Calhoun trying to justify himself against a conspiracy to damage him and further enraged the president. The dispute was finally resolved when Van Buren offered to resign, allowing Jackson to reorganize his cabinet by asking for the resignations of the anti-Eaton cabinet members. Postmaster General William T. Barry, was the lone cabinet member to stay. Eaton eventually received appointments that took him away from Washington, first as governor of Florida Territory, and then minister to Spain. The episode influenced the emergence of feminism. The cabinet wives insisted that the interests and honor of all women were at stake. They believed a responsible woman should never accord a man sexual favors without the assurance of marriage. A woman who broke that code was dishonorable and unacceptable. How notes that this was the feminist spirit that shaped the women's rights movement in the next decade. The aristocratic wives of European diplomats in Washington shrugged the matter off, they had their national interest to uphold and had seen how life worked in Paris and London. Tariff of Abominations The Tariff of 1828, also called the Tariff of Abominations, was a protective tariff passed in the early 19th century to support growing domestic industries by raising the costs of imported goods. This view came to be known as protectionism. Many people in southern states, especially South Carolina, opposed the tariff. They opposed protective tariffs because they hurt the state financially. Instead, they supported the free trade of goods and threatened to nullify the tariff of 1828 in a significant challenge to national authority. The controversy over the tariff of abominations dragged on until 1833 and nearly sparked the armed conflict, although the debate between protectionists and free traders never really ended. Congress began using protective tariffs after the War of 1812. The tariffs during this period were designed to shield young American manufacturers from a flood of cheap British goods and help pay off wartime debt. Another tariff bill in 1824 increased and expanded those rates. Over time, Southerners began to see these as being punitive to their region. Not only did they end up paying more for imported goods, but they also often found themselves blocked from foreign markets or stuck with retaliatory tariffs on cotton and other raw agricultural products. By 1828, the economy was slowing, and Congress turned again to the tariff as a remedy. Because 1828 was an election year, a considerable amount of political deception was involved in the debate over the final bill. Free trade southerners ended up supporting much higher tariffs rates, ranging from 30 to 60 percent on over 90 percent of all imports, in the belief that the defeat of the bill would hurt incumbent President John Quincy Adams. The plan backfired when the House of Representatives passed the bill on May 11, 1828, by a vote of 105 to 94. Adams, believing the bill would do some good despite its unpopularity, signed it into law. Backslash, 
South Carolina's congressional delegation met shortly after the bill was signed to debate their next steps, which included talk of seceding from the union. They could not come to a consensus and finally deferred to the suggestion of fellow South Carolinians, Vice President John C. Calhoun to wait until after the election. Calhoun would soon join the ticket of Adams' opponent, Andrew Jackson, and had some reason to believe Jackson might reduce or eliminate the tariff. Jackson won the election but gave little indication he was ready to abandon what South Carolinians had termed the tariff of abominations when he assumed office in the spring of 1829. In the interim, Vice President-elect John Calhoun anonymously wrote and published the South Carolina Exposition and Protest, also known as Calhoun's Exposition. Calhoun's main argument was that the tariff bill, which favored manufacturers in the North while hurting Southern agriculturalists, was unconstitutional and that states retained the sovereign right to reject or nullify unjust federal laws. In December 1828, the South Carolina legislature ordered 5,000 copies of Calhoun's exposition be printed and distributed. Despite Calhoun's hopes, Andrew Jackson seemed reluctant to deal with the tariff issue when he took office. The problem might have died away, but for a Senate debate between Daniel Webster of Massachusetts and Robert Hayne of South Carolina over the tariff of abominations in January 1830. Hayne argued that the states were sovereign and had the right to strike down unfair laws in the name of state and personal liberty, to which Webster famously responded, liberty and union, now and forever, one and inseparable. The ideological split divided Congress, and eventually, the Jackson administration. Calhoun announced that he had been the author of the incendiary exposition and protest, solidifying his position as the state's rights movement leader. While not wholly opposed to states' rights, Jackson was nevertheless firm that he would rather die in the last ditch than see the Union ripped apart. The division came into full view at a Jefferson Day dinner in the spring of 1830 during the traditional toasts. Looking right at Calhoun, Jackson toasted, The Union, it must be preserved. Calhoun responded, The Union, next to our liberty, most dear. Never close. The two men found their professional relationship irrevocably damaged and remained at odds until Calhoun resigned his office to take the place of Robert Hayne in the Senate in late 1832. Tensions between South Carolina and the federal authorities continued to rise for the next two years, and a war started to look like a real possibility. To defuse the situation, Congress took up the tariff issue again in 1832, passing a new bill that marginally lowered the rate set by the Tariff of Abominations. South Carolina found the changes insufficient and formally adopted an ordinance of nullification on November 24, 1832, declaring the tariffs of 1828 and 1832 null and void as of February 1, 1833. On December 10, 1832, Andrew Jackson issued the proclamation to the people of South Carolina, declaring nullification incompatible with the Constitution and the idea of the Union. He also ordered his Secretary of War to prepare for possible military action, to avert open war, Congress quickly passed the Compromise Tariff of 1833, which set a timetable to reduce the tariff rates back to their 1816 levels over the years. The South Carolina legislature accepted this as a victory and withdrew their threat to nullify, ending the immediate crisis. However, the ideological divide would continue to grow for the next 30 years, contributing to the secession of southern states and the start of the American Civil War. Indian Removal Act of 1830. Early in the 19th century, while the rapidly growing United States expanded into the Lower South, white settlers faced what they considered an obstacle. This area was home to the Cherokee, Creek, Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Seminole nations. These Indian nations, in the view of the settlers and many other white Americans, were standing in the way of progress. Eager for land to raise cotton, the settlers pressured the federal government to acquire Indian territory. Andrew Jackson, from Tennessee, was a forceful proponent of Indian removal. In 1814 he commanded the U.S. military forces that defeated a faction of the Creek Nation. In their defeat, the Creeks lost 22 million acres of land in southern Georgia and central Alabama. The U.S. acquired more land in 1818 when, spurred in part by the motivation to punish the Seminoles for their practice of harboring fugitive slaves, Jackson's troops invaded Spanish Florida. 
From 1814 to 1824, Jackson was instrumental in negotiating nine out of eleven treaties that divested the southern tribes of their eastern lands in exchange for lands in the west. The tribes agreed to the treaties for strategic reasons. They wanted to appease the government in the hopes of retaining some of their lands, and they tried to protect themselves from white harassment. As a result of the treaties, the United States gained control over three quarters of Alabama and Florida and parts of Georgia, Tennessee, Mississippi, Kentucky, and North Carolina. However, this was a period of voluntary Indian migration, and only a small number of Creeks, Cherokee, and Choctaws moved to the new lands. In 1823 the Supreme Court handed down a decision that stated that Indians could occupy lands within the United States but could not hold title to those lands. This was because their right of occupancy was subordinate to the United States' right of discovery. In response to the significant threat this posed, the Creeks, Cherokee, and Chickasaw instituted policies of restricting land sales to the government. They wanted to protect what remained of their land before it was too late. Although the five Indian nations had made earlier attempts at resistance, many of their strategies were non-violent. One method was to adopt Anglo-American practices, such as large-scale farming, Western education, and slaveholding. This earned the nations the designation of the five civilized tribes. They adopted this policy of assimilation to coexist with settlers and ward off hostility. But it only made whites jealous and resentful. Other attempts involved ceding portions of their land to the United States to retain control over at least part of their territory or of the new territory they received in exchange. Some Indian nations refused to leave their land, the Creeks and the Seminoles even waged war to protect their territory. The first Seminole War lasted from 1817 to 1818. The Seminoles were aided by fugitive slaves who had found protection among them and lived with them for years. The presence of the fugitives enraged white planters and fueled their desire to defeat the Seminoles. The Cherokee used legal means in their attempt to safeguard their rights. They sought protection from land-hungry white settlers, who continually harassed them by stealing their livestock, burning their towns, and squatting on their land. In 1827 the Cherokee adopted a written constitution declaring themselves to be a sovereign nation. They based this on United States policy, in former treaties, Indian nations had been sovereign to be legally capable of ceding their lands. Now the Cherokee hoped to use this status to their advantage. However, the state of Georgia did not recognize their sovereign status but saw them as tenants living on state land. The Cherokee took their case to the Supreme Court, which ruled against them. The Cherokee went to the Supreme Court again in 1831. This time they based their appeal on an 1830 Georgia law that prohibited whites from living on Indian territory after March 31, 1831, without a license from the state. The state legislature had written this law to justify removing white missionaries who were helping the Indians resist removal. The court, this time, decided in favor of the Cherokee. It stated that the Cherokee had the right to self-government and declared Georgia's extension of state law over them to be unconstitutional. However, the state of Georgia refused to abide by the court decision, and President Jackson refused to enforce the law. In 1830, just a year after taking office, Jackson pushed a new piece of legislation called the Indian Removal Act through both houses of Congress. It gave the president power to negotiate removal treaties with Indian tribes living east of the Mississippi. Under these treaties, the Indians were to give up their lands east of the Mississippi in exchange for lands to the west. Those wishing to remain in the east would become citizens of their home state. This act affected not only the southeastern nations but many others further north. The removal was supposed to be voluntary and peaceful, and it was that way for the tribes that agreed to the conditions. But the southeastern nations resisted, and Jackson forced them to leave. Jackson's attitude toward Native Americans was paternalistic and patronizing, he described them as children in need of guidance. And believed the removal policy was beneficial to the Indians. Most white Americans thought that the United States would never extend beyond the Mississippi. Removal would save Indian people from whites' depredations and resettle them in an area where they could govern themselves in peace.
But some Americans saw this as an excuse for a brutal and inhumane course of action and protested loudly against removal. Their protests did not save the southeastern nations from removal, however. The Choctaws were the first to sign a removal treaty, which they did in September of 1830. Some chose to stay in Mississippi under the terms of the Removal Act. But though the War Department made some attempts to protect those who survived, it was no match for the land-hungry whites who squatted on the Choctaw territory or cheated them out of their holdings. Soon most of the remaining Choctaws, weary of mistreatment, sold their land and moved west. For the next 28 years, the United States government struggled to force the relocation of the southeastern nations. The United States coerced a small group of Seminoles into signing a removal treaty in 1833, but most of the tribe declared the treaty illegitimate and refused to leave. The resulting struggle was the Second Seminole War, which lasted from 1835 to 1842. As in the First War, fugitive slaves fought beside the Seminoles who had taken them in. Thousands of lives were lost in the war, which cost the Jackson administration approximately 40 to 60 million dollars, ten times the amount it had allotted for Indian removal. In the end, most of the Seminoles moved to the new territory. The few who remained had to defend themselves in the Third Seminole War when the U.S. military attempted to drive them out. Finally, the United States paid the remaining Seminoles to move west. The Creeks also refused to emigrate. They signed a treaty in March 1832, which opened a large portion of their Alabama land to white settlement. Still, they guaranteed them protected ownership of the remaining part, divided among the leading families. However, the government did not protect them from speculators, who quickly cheated them out of their lands. By 1835 the destitute Creeks began stealing livestock and crops from white settlers. Some eventually committed arson and murder in retaliation for their brutal treatment. In 1836 the Secretary of War ordered the removal of the Creeks as a military necessity. By 1837, approximately 15,000 Creeks had migrated west. They had never signed a removal treaty. The Chickasaws had seen removal as inevitable and had not resisted. They signed a treaty in 1832 which stated that the federal government would provide them with suitable western land and protect them until they moved. But once again, the onslaught of white settlers proved too much for the War Department, and it backed down on its promise. The Chickasaws were forced to pay the Choctaws for the right to live on the part of their western allotment. They migrated there in the winter of 1837. The Cherokee, on the other hand, were tricked by an illegitimate treaty. In 1833, a small faction agreed to sign a removal agreement, the Treaty of New Ekota. The leaders of this group were not the recognized leaders of the Cherokee Nation, and over 15,000 Cherokees, led by Chief John Ross, signed the petition in protest. The Supreme Court ignored their demands and ratified the treaty in 1836. The Cherokee were given two years to migrate voluntarily, at the end of which time the United States would forcibly remove them. By 1838 only 2,000 had migrated, 16,000 remained on their land. The U.S. government sent in 7,000 troops, who forced the Cherokees into stockades at Bayonet Point. They were not allowed time to gather their belongings, and as they left, whites looted their homes. Then began the march known as the Trail of Tears, in which 4,000 Cherokee people died of cold, hunger, and disease on their way to the western lands. By 1837, the Jackson administration had removed 46,000 Native American people from their land east of the Mississippi, and had secured treaties that led to removing a slightly larger number. Most of the five southeastern nations had been relocated west, opening 25 million acres of land to white settlement and slavery. You've been listening to the RPTM podcast. If you like what you hear, please rate us on whatever platform you're listening on. Join us again next week when we talk about the seen and unseen of U.S. history. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. Also, for more information, check out the show notes 
on my website. The show was produced by me. Our editor is me. Written and researched by me. Music is Down South by Bliv Beats. I'm Ryan Lancaster, and this was the RPTM Podcast.